Happy Friday! I'm inspiring myself today with a mug because I'm tired and it's Friday and I kind of just want to take it easy and so I'm trying to find my little fighter in me to get up and get stuff done today. How about you guys? <laughs> my kids made it through their section of online school. They have a week off and then they go back to physical school on the 12th. So. Um, it's kind of nice that they have a week off to celebrate. So I'm going to try to do some fun things this weekend and next week, ride some bikes with them, you know, take them out, go have lunch, breakfast, that type of thing. So um, means a little less work for me. So I have to get a bunch done today. So I've got my fighter mug with my coffee so I can get through it and I can try to take this week a little bit light. Happy Friday. Good morning. Good morning. Today is Q&A day, guys. Um, no formal topic today. Uh, I'm Dr. Trisha Pingle. This is your morning checkup. It is Friday, October 2nd. We have hit October, which is crazy. Um, I don't, uh, I, I see all these Halloween decorations around and um, I honestly haven't, uh, didn't even remember it was going to be Halloween. It's crazy. Uh, so maybe I can do some decorating today. I'm sure my kids would, would dig that. Um, all right, so I already have a question. So there we go. So good morning, I have RLS, any suggestions? Yeah, I mean, restless leg syndrome is linked to a bunch of different things, okay, first of all. So make sure that you're looking at this from a holistic standpoint, okay? A lot of the treatment for RLS is medication, uh, but the medication isn't always uh, the, the root cause, right? So what I tend to find, these are common uh, causes of RLS that maybe are not being considered. Could it be something else? Of course, okay? So I'm just like to give you information on stuff that maybe hasn't been thought about. Uh, number one, uh, magnesium deficiency. Any type of electrolyte deficiency really can cause a lot of restless legs. I have seen stress response at night. People whose cortisol levels are jumping up throughout the night and they're not getting full restless sleep or rest, restful sleep, they will be restless. Um, I have also seen iron deficiency or iron um, metabolism issues cause a lot of restless legs as well. So whenever someone has something like that, I say to look at a couple things. One, look at stress, okay? Do you have too much stress? Are you worrying at night? And what kind of go hand in hand with that is what type of nutritional deficiencies might that be causing? And are those nutritional deficiencies causing your legs to kind of uh, jump around? So many times it's been a very clear case of magnesium. Um, I've had many clients who take magnesium, restless legs go away. I've had others where they don't. For me, I had restless legs when my iron was really low and I didn't draw the association. And then when I started taking iron, this was way back in the day, all of a sudden I didn't have RLS. Now, if I have a really stressful day or like I have something that's really weighing on my heart or my mind, my legs are restless. So there's a lot of different things that can cause it. So I would definitely look into the nutritional aspect, the lifestyle aspect. Um, are you stretching? Oh, stretching before um, bed can help as well. Sometimes the muscles are just kind of in this constant contraction. So when you start to relax, they go like this, right? So sometimes relaxing them ahead of time with a bath, stretching, exercise can also make a difference. So those are a few suggestions to look into that maybe you haven't considered, Carolyn. Okay. Happy fall, good morning, happy Friday, happy Friday. It is Q&A day, so if you came armed with questions, throw them at me, I will do my absolute best. Um, so I've got my kids interrupting me as we go. Um, <laughs> there we go, take care of that one, so do I. Uh, any other um, questions today? Did you guys like the live yesterday on multivitamins? Did you learn? Had a lot of people follow up and say, oh, is my multivitamin good, this or that? I mean, there's a lot to look at in a label, right? A lot to look at. So this week has had some very varied topics, which I'm kind of enjoying. I did take your recommendation on a few other topics. Brain fog, what do you want to know, my dear? I know you want to talk about it, but what in specific? Happy Friday. I mean, in general, brain fog. I do have an article, Vic, on brain fog, actually, at drpingle.com. Um, in fact, let me look it up. I'll, I'll paste the link below your question. Um, but 
Um, do, 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 do. I do have an article. It was written in July on how to get rid of brain frog, fog. Um, I do have a video on there as well, common causes of brain fog. I think one of the um, most, most of the reasons I get brain fog and perhaps many do is a uh, stress response. You're too busy looking at the bear that you miss all the flowers and the lakes that you run by. You know, uh, we can't possibly be under stress and catch everything. You know, I think being someone who's always tended to be a multitasker, um, as I become more impacted by stress, um, of course that, um, uh, can impact the way that I think. Right? I can't multitask as easily. See, I was posting something and lost my train of thought. That happens. Um, <laughs> uh, thyroid gland problems can definitely cause brain fog. Um, dehydration, one of the most common reasons I find dehydration and stress um, are very common in brain fog. If you don't have enough oxygen going to your brain, you're not going to be able to do anything. So exercise, water, healthy food, diet, those types of things are very important. Um, being able to calm down and be in a parasympathetic state will give you better focus. Um, or it'll give you a more distinct focus when you really need to focus on a stress, but you've got to be able to go back to that relaxation state as well. I think we also expect too much from ourselves. We expect that we're going to catch everything. You know, that we're just going to be these beings that just everything that comes at us, we're just going to, we're just going to get done. And I think we're, we're not being realistic, you know, we're not all super people, but I think our world and our technology has taught us that we're supposed to always have it all together all of the time, right? I'm having one of those weeks. I have a lot on my list that I have not gotten done and I'm a very uh, type A person. I'm a very organized person. And so when I start to feel like I'm not getting things done or like my brain is kind of foggy, like I'm not getting it done, I beat myself up, right? I think we put way too much pressure on ourselves sometimes. We are only human and we do need downtimes. So if you're finding yourself with brain fog a lot and you've ruled out things like thyroid, you know, um, dehydration, uh, insomnia, those types of things, start looking at could that stress response be causing some of the brain fog? Yeah? I hope that helps. Uh, let's see, brought it up yesterday, curious to know which foods are good and bad for testosterone. Um, you know, that's a hard answer because everyone is so different. So if you're someone that has a lot of extra fat mass, so if you have abdominal fat and stuff, the body's going to lean more towards estrogen storage. So even if you incorporated more testosterone foods, which I suppose would be more protein type foods, um, it kind of depends on your metabolism, how you're breaking it down and how active you are. Typically, if I want to stimulate someone's testosterone, I tell them to start working out. You know, burning off that extra fat, building more lean muscle, um, increases your testosterone levels, right? Um, watching your stress helps to increase your testosterone levels. So I don't know, um, without even further research, I'm sure there's foods out there directly that increase testosterones, and I'm assuming they're amino acid-based foods. Um, but just because you make more testosterone doesn't mean that you utilize it well. A lot of people will make testosterone and it'll immediately convert into estrogen and that's because a lot of the times of extra fat mass. So my suggestions for men with testosterone issues, um, if we're staying away from supplementation type things, is to make sure that you're doing daily exercise. And if you're on testosterone, if you're not working out every day, a lot of it can more easily go to estrone. So it's very, very important to be very active, especially if you're on testosterone. It could backfire on you otherwise, okay? Must be very active. I hope that helps, Richard. Dangers of synthetic hormones and birth control. You know, um, Gretchen, there's pros and cons. Um, I tend to lean more bioidentical for sure. Um, I would rather use a bioidentical hormone than a synthetic hormone because I'm trying to um, have it mimic the natural rhythm and natural production. However, that doesn't mean that bioidentical hormones are always safe either. I think there's a lot of propensity. Same thing we just talked about with testosterone. Um, you know, if there's a lot of fat mass, often even giving a bioidentical estra estradiol can turn into an estrone just like a synthetic can. So I think it's looking at the whole picture, the liver support, the exercise, the diet, and then making a decision. You know, if I have a 21 year old that wants to be on a birth control pill for a short period of time before they start having children, I don't worry too much about it, but I do make sure that they're doing liver support, proper diet, proper exercise, and that we're watching the hormone levels. 
You know, and then when you move to more someone who's in perimenopause or menopause, I tend to lean more on the bioidentical end um, in order to try and keep estrone levels low. However, it depends on the person, you know, and I think for me, my, my thought on any um, medical condition or any therapy, here's the way I look at it, okay? <laughs> I'm the physician, so my job is to say, okay, here's the pros and cons of this, here's the pros and cons of this, here's what your body is telling us, let's talk about it and let's figure it out. So I'm never fully for or against things. I have seen high dose progestins, high dose synthetic hormones cause a lot of problems. I've also seen high dose bioidentical hormones cause a lot of problems. Um, so I think it comes down to looking at that individuality. The concerns that most people have with the synthetic hormones and myself as well is that um, they're not exactly the form of the hormone. So there's a lot more side effects that can occur from it, such as blood clots, you know, cardiovascular, such especially as you get older. So I try not to use high doses of anything and I always try to find the cause first before I supplement hormones. I think that's, the, that's how I do it differently. A lot of people supplement the hormones first and then maybe try to find the cause. I try to find the cause first before I supplement the hormones if there's a problem going on. Um, so I don't know if that helps. Um, I do have some articles on that, Gretchen, um, on drpingle.com about bioidentical hormones. I do plan to kind of talk about it a little bit more as well. Um, for those of you that may not know the difference, uh, bioidentical hormones is usually compounded and they're, form they're compounded into the actual form of estrogen. So it'll be like estradiol, estriol, right? Both of those can convert into estrone, which can become problematic. The synthetic ones, you know, it's like they go into the body and the body's like, hmm, that kind of looks like estrogen. Like, I think it is, but I'm not sure. So sometimes you can't control the side effect of that, right? So if it doesn't know what it is and the body's under stress and it's not metabolizing well, it can convert it into estrone. Now, once again, this is body specific. It's person specific. It doesn't always turn into estrone. It's not always bad, but those are the things you have to pay attention to when you start to look at, do I want to use bioidentical or do I want to use synthetic, right? Um, and looking at each individual person. Does that help a little bit, Gretchen? Um, I know you said progestin specifically. Yeah, I mean, I prefer to use progesterone. Um, but then again, I, you know, there have been cases where I've had to use progestin. Um, very rarely for me, um, I typically use progesterone. But most of the time, I try to help the liver support metabolism of hormones and give the nutrition for the manufacturing of hormones so we don't have to use hormone, right? Where I see most people using progestin wrong um, is infertility. They use it in really high dose, right? It can cause some problems. So anyway, I hope that helps. Okay. Um, for for plants, what one should go for breakfast? What should you eat for breakfast? Is that what you're asking? Um, kind of depends on your whole diet. I do believe in eating breakfast. I'm not someone that likes to skip breakfast. I feel like you wake up, you got to be energetic, you got to start burning, so you have to put some food in. Whether you go work out first and then come back and eat, or whether you eat and go work out, whatever, but you got to get some food in there. I tend to lead more towards a really, um, fiber in the morning, so I tend to do oatmeal, or I'll do some sort of, um, uh, I, I like cocoa yo yogurt, which is a coconut-based yogurt, but it has a really high probiotic um, aspect to it with a little bit of homemade granola. Um, a lot of people, um, if I, for people that like to do like eggs and things like that for breakfast, I usually recommend you add a lot of vegetables to it. Do a vegetable omelet rather than just scrambled eggs. You know, try to get some veggies in there. Veggies are great for breakfast. Um, a lot of people do smoothies. Um, my son does a smoothie. My nine-year-old does a smoothie pretty much every day for breakfast. You know, those types of things. I think that's what you're asking. What should you have for breakfast? I think, um, you know, um, this whole idea that we should have cereal and milk um, probably isn't the best for our energy or for what we're trying to accomplish in a day. I think, um, you know, if I um, can add some avocado in there, I can add some good fat. So if I do oatmeal, by the way, I'm doing like a steel cut oatmeal or a, a gluten-free, you know, based oat um, with nuts, fresh berries, you know, sometimes a little bit of granola, you know, trying to get more things in there. I've been known to eat an avocado for breakfast. <laughs> Hope that helps. Um, I see a few more. More questions on Facebook today than Instagram. You Instagram, you're all out there. Okay, how to get rid of it. Vic, did I? Uh, yeah, that you got it, right? Awesome. Uh, hello, I was wondering what you think about Hawthorne, Willow, and Nettle. Um, 
I, I, wow, those are three totally different subjects. Um, Hawthorne, um, that's a beautiful herb for the heart, nice and cardioprotective. That's a nice suggestion for an article. I'll write it down. Um, I will absolutely write that down because um, some of these herbs, it's like I don't have their whole uh, botanical profiles in front of me. Willow typically is more like, uh, works kind of like a Tylenol, you know? Um, nettle, very much involved for allergies. Um, that's when I use it primarily for is allergies. So I don't know, you know, as far as what do I think about them, I think herbs are fantastic when used appropriately. So I think what a lot of people do is they look at the use of herbs like a drug. Like, okay, um, I have a headache, so I take aspirin. You know, I have a headache, so I take butter bar. You know, I have allergies, so I take nettle. Um, I think a lot of people start to look at that from the conventional model, right? I have a symptom, and this is the herb I take for that symptom. I disagree with that approach. I think herbs are used to modify the body and to protect it and help it respond naturally. So um, they're used to create a certain environment in the body. So when I look at it, you know, nettle could be great for one person with allergies, but not great for someone else with allergies. It kind of depends on the underlying body. So I love all herbs. I don't, I'm not against the use of any herbs as far as medicinal if they're used correctly, right? And I think understanding the herb, what is it supposed to do? What's the long-term impact of it? And what are the herbs that work synergistically with it are very important subjects. Now, the layman wouldn't know that, right? You wouldn't know that necessarily, which herb works with what. And that's why working with a naturopath or an integrative practitioner or an herbalist um, can really um, benefit your health. Um, and that's why a lot of the, even like acupuncturists use Chinese herb combinations. And the reason they do that is because they work synergistically together, right? And even as a practitioner that's learned all these herbs, I have to look that up before I prescribe it. I have to make sure, okay, this works with that. I mean, I kind of know, you know, like your gut instinct, but those three together, I wouldn't have thought of pairing together. I don't know if you take them for the same purpose or not, um, Kelly, but um, they all have, they're all great herbs that work very well, if that's what you're asking. Um, okay, hang on. I am coming back to Instagram for a sec, okay? Um, cause I see some comments over here. I love smoothies for breakfast or oatmeal. I do the same thing. This morning I had oatmeal with oat milk and, uh, a gluten-free granola on top cause I couldn't decide <laughs> between them, um, and my coffee. Um, I'm hungry already though. I do have that problem. I have a fat metabolism for carbohydrates like that. So usually within about an hour I'm starving. So I usually do a couple different breakfasts. I do something before I do my live so that I'm not lightheaded when I'm talking to you guys. And then I eat again right afterwards, usually something with a little bit more protein base um, or I'll have some nuts or something to that effect. Um, estrogen dominance after menopause absolutely happens. So the way that estrogen essentially works is you've got these, basically these three different estrogens. And this goes true for men too. I mean, obviously women have more estrogen than men, but um, the storage form of estrogen called estrone is present both in men and women, okay? And it is the one that causes problems when it's too much. So what can happen is the estradiol levels, which are what most people are monitoring when it comes to menopause, or even andropause, you're looking at the estradiol levels to drop. So your estradiol levels drop, but you still have signs of estrogen dominance. Why? Right? If I don't have any estrogen, why am I having signs of estrogen dominance? Why am I still bleeding? Right? And in men, why am I having prostate problems? Right? So these, these things still happen after the hormones decline. And usually it's because the estradiol dropped, but the estron did not. So estron is a storage form of estrogen and it typically stores in the fat cells for the most part. So um, particularly if there's weight management issues, a lot of the times you won't see the estrone move as quickly. If the liver is bogged down, if the liver's not spending time taking out its garbage every night, you'll see a lot of hormone storage issues. Um, there's a compound called DIM, D-I-M, and I'm not gonna go into the full name for you because it's a tongue twister. DIM, indole 3 carbonyl or um, even calcium D-glucarate, these are three different supplements that are used in order to kind of go in, take that estrone, and remove it. And I use these in both men and women. So if I have men that have um, prostate um, you know, enlargement, 
prostate problems. Typically, I find that their estrogen is a bit high. When I see men with dropping testosterone, going back to the testosterone question, um, often the testosterone is being made, it's just it's being converted into estrone. Either the person is sedentary, or they have a little extra fat around their belly, or their body is bogged down to where it's not managing hormones well. Uh, people with MTHFR mutation, uh, which is the mutation for converting folic acid to folate, have a lot of problems with estrogen storage. You see that in polycystic ovarian syndrome quite a bit. Um, you see that in women that have really painful menstrual cycles, um, even after menopause. Uh, often women will kind of continue, you can't really call it menopause if you're still bleeding, but you still kind of have those symptoms of that. So in that case, going back to your question, estrogen dominance, dominance after menopause, you want to make sure you're looking at estrone. So not just estradiol. And you want to balance that out with testosterone and progesterone. Okay, so sometimes that means you need a little extra liver support. Um, exercise helps clear estrone. Liver support helps clear estrone. So any type of liver capsule, um, I typically use ones with burdock root. Um, I, sometimes I use methionine, uh, particularly if I think there's an MTHFR. I have a liver blend on my next rollout of supplements. Um, and I'm excited for it because it's a great one. And it's got a combination of herbs and a combination of amino acids in order to help clear um, things from the liver, including excess hormones. If you're really someone that has that estrogen dominance, um, look into DIM, D-I-M. Um, I do have an article on estrogen dominance um, at drpingle.com. It's not specific to after menopause, but it, same type of thing. Hope that helps, yeah? Did that answer your question? Nature ed, nature ed, nature. <laughs> All right. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Supplements that help PND and sinuses. I already do rinses. Yeah. Uh, look to the diet. Are you still eating dairy? I know. Don't throw tomatoes at me. I've got a screen. You can throw whatever you want, but it'll hit you, not me. Uh, take a look at dairy, Susan. Are you still eating it? Let me know. Um, curious, you heard foods impact it more than others. Yeah, I mean, Richard, when it comes to the testosterone, I mean, more lean proteins are probably going to have a more favorable impact on testosterone than, you know, processed fatty foods. And most of that has to do with liver, liver conversion, liver being bogged down, toxins, other toxins that have to be cleared in the body. So the cleaner the diet, the more whole food the diet, the better in general for your hormone system, no matter what hormone situation you're dealing with. Okay, um, typically um, a cleaner, more whole food based diet is gonna do better, okay? Good morning, Fred. I'm glad there's not an issue there with testosterone. That's great. Watch out for estrogen conversion as you get older. What would help in raising extremely low pulse and blood pressure? Um, once again, depends on why. Okay, is it low because there's, you know, I guess in the Chinese medicine, they say there's a low vital force, there's a low uh, movement of energy. Why? Are there nutrition deficiencies? Are you exercising? Did they find a problem with the heart? You know, you got to look at those types of things. I think um, a low high heart rate, um, it depends, also depends on how low. I mean, I have a very low heart rate in general, but I'm also fairly fit. Um, and my blood pressure is normally pretty low unless I'm at a doctor's office. Then it goes up to normal because <laughs> I hate being there. I hate having my blood pressure taken. Um, if I take it myself, it's normally pretty low. I've always been like 90 over 60, right? Um, so I think it kind of depends on what you're doing. But I would say B vitamins, uh, methylated B vitamins, very um, important for regulating blood pressure either direction. I think exercise, being able to run, make sure your heart is working efficiently. You definitely want to rule out any problems with the heart. Go to the cardiologist, make sure there's no problem, there's no valve issues, there's no reasons outside of that. Adrenal function, if your adrenal function is poor, a lot of the times your blood pressure will be lower, your pulse will be lower. So that's why B vitamins can also help with that, as well as herbs for adrenal function. Now these are things you should always talk to your doctor about. I'm just giving you the education, okay? Don't take it as a prescription. Talk to your doctor. But those are the things I would kind of start um, exploring. You know, sodium, potassium levels, magnesium levels, B vitamin levels, um, exercise, how's the adrenal function, uh, is the DHEA appropriate, where are you at in the whole hormone scheme of things. You know, there's a lot of things to look at. Sometimes people just run lower in blood pressure and heart rate. But you got to rule everything else out, right? 
Make sense? Okay. Uh, I'm taking them for a few different reasons, but I feel like they've worked wonderfully on top of my vitamins. Good. I'm glad you're liking the vitamins. Thank you. I appreciate it. I do like the feedback. I like them as well. I use them um, myself. So, you know, and they've done well for me too. Um, but yeah, sorry, Kelly, and I don't mean to be vague on the different herbs. It's just there's so much information on those. You know, if you look up botanical monographs, um, if you type in like, for example, willow, you know, botanical monograph, you can see a lot of the uses of it. And a lot of the times if you get a good site, um, there's a few different sites, I think botanical.org or botanical.com, they'll have links to studies on all of these herbs. Um, it has the history of the herb. So that's kind of fun to learn, you know, and learn a little bit more about the ones you're taking and why you're taking them. And then you'll know when you don't have to take them anymore if you understand how they work, right? When do I think the liver blend vitamins will come out? You know, Kelly, I want to bring them out soon, but you know, I have to make my original investment back, to be honest. So when I, when I create a line, I've got to make that investment back before I can reinvest. So um, hopefully soon. I mean, it's, you know, keep sharing, keep spreading the line, keep showing interest. The more people that show interest, the more people that buy, the more um, comfortable I am expanding it faster. You know, I mean, that's a business decision. Would I love to release all of them right now? Yes, I have a whole line um, that has been planned out in phases. I wanna release them all tomorrow if I could, um, but I have to do it in phases. Just, that's just the business, the business side of it all. So. Um, hopefully in the next couple months, it is definitely the multivitamin and the liver support are right up there. Like they're next. Okay. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, are B vitamins a good multi, are B vitamins in a good multi enough or need extra? Depends. If you're under stress at all, or you have any sort of hormone issues, you have any sort of energy issues, I take additional B vitamins, a methylated B vitamins. I take the total B complex um, on top of my multivitamin. Um, I just find I feel better. Um, I also have MTHFR mutations, so my B vitamins can get off really easily, so I make sure that I stay on top of that. Um, I suppose some people probably do find with a multivitamin, but they usually don't put a ton of B vitamins in a multivitamin, just so you know. Um, in my world, where I'm seeing a lot of stress response, adrenal fatigue, hormone irregularities, you know, problems in the endocrine system, I always am prescribing B vitamins on top of multivitamins because B vitamins are prevalent in the endocrine system, are required for the endocrine system, and are the first things to drop when you're under stress. So in my world, what I see on a daily basis is a lot of need for B vitamins, right? So I can only speak to the world that I'm in primarily. Uh, do I take all four capsules every day of the total mineral? I do not. I take two, one to two. Um, and, and the reason being is that I have a very healthy plant-based, mineral-based diet. Um, and um, on top of that, um, whenever I've done my nutritional testing, my minerals are pretty darn good. So I do it more just to kind of keep those trace minerals in. Um, so the dosing on that total mineral is anywhere from one to four per day, depending on need. So when you talk to your doctor, you look at your overall health, you can kind of make that distinction. For me, I rather take less of it every single day um, in con combined with a diet than have a poor diet and have to take four. So that's kind of how I use it. I'm not sure um, if, you, if you have it, if you use it differently or recommend differently, but that's how I do it. I usually take one to two a day. Um, I find when I take too many minerals at once, I swell. That's just me. Doesn't matter what brand. Has to do with water, right? Good morning, no dairy, well that's good. Often when the sinuses inflame, um, sometimes there's an actual structural issue, Susan, in the sinuses that has to be taken care of. Sometimes the sinus cavities are full of a monkey mucus. So what I'm looking for when you ask what can you do, do you have to try to find the cause of the mucus? Is there a reason why your sinuses are pooling more mucus than others? Um, sometimes it can be a food allergy, an environmental allergy, sometimes it's inflammatory, sometimes it's gut flora. Um, there's a lot of great research on allergies and the flora of the gut. So taking a really good probiotic is usually very much um, beneficial in sinus issues. Um, sometimes you can't get away with it. Sometimes you live in an area where the allergen is just so great, it's hard to stay ahead of it. The sinus wrenches that you're doing are great. 
um, cause they keep things from getting backed up. So that'll lower infection, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the symptom will go away, right? So some things to talk about with your doctor would be, is it possible that you're eating something that's causing a flare in addition to environmental allergies? Are you keeping your sinuses clean, which it sounds like you are, and what other types of supplements can you use to help with the histamine reaction? Some of those that people use, and I'll name them off for you, Susan, so you can look them up. Uh, NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine. Vitamin C is used quite a bit. Quercetin, used quite a bit. Probiotics, used a lot. Uh, those are the top four coming to mind. Um, a lot of people do use things like nettles. Um, nettles is also a great diuretic. Um, so making sure that you have everything you can to modify immune response is about the best you can do in that scenario. And then depending on how severe it is, sometimes you can't take get rid of it 100%, but you can get you know, 80%, 85%. Um, for people that are really miserable, you know, when they have to use allergy medications, I do. Um, I don't like to, right? No one likes to take medications, but if you're really miserable where you can't go about your day, then um, you take everything you can to boost your immune system, to help your immune response. And um, in the meantime, if you have to use something like that, then you do. I hope that helps. Two caps. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at too. I agree with you on that, Dr. Thiner. Um, do you have your own line of vitamins? Oh, hi, welcome. You're new to my channel. Nice to meet you. I am Dr. Pingle. Pleasure. I'm here every day, Monday through Friday, 9.15 for the most part. Um, yeah, Total Health Apothecary. Dot com. Um, if you also, you can also go to um, drpingle.com and I believe there's a link. Actually, I'm at drpingle.com and I don't see a link. It's there somewhere. I'll make sure it gets back on there. So totalhealthapothecary.com. Okay. Oh, it's up top. So if you go to drpingle.com and you go to the very top, it says about Total Health Apothecary bookstore and contact us. So if you go to Total Health Apothecary, you can go from there as well. There's only seven in there right now, but they're great supplements. If you have any questions, you let me know. And all the information is at the website. What's in them, what they're good for. I have product sheets, all sorts of stuff. If you can't find something, just holler. Okay, best supplements, vitamins to help naturally with depression and mood support. Yeah, B vitamins for sure, methylated vitamins for sure, rule out MTHFR mutation. Always check for that in anxiety, depression, always. Um, vitamin D, fish oils, uh, good fats are always beneficial to depression. Uh, often you have to go kind of high in dose on those good fats. Um, so you wanna make sure that the digestion is good. Okay, so another thing that causes depression is poor gut flora. So the problem is all of these go hand in hand, right? If you have poor gut flora, you probably have poor nutrition. If you have poor nutrition, you probably have poor gut flora, right? If you're under a lot of stress, you have a lot of anxiety, you don't break food down well, so you don't get as much nutrient absorption. So whenever it comes to anxiety, depression, I'm looking at a few different things. I'm looking at, one, is there any physiological reason why you would be more prone to it, like MTHFR mutation? And then how can we supplement diet and lifestyle-wise? Improve digestion, get better bacterial flora, better utilization, of fats, make sure nutrient levels are up to par in order to make serotonin. We need B vitamins, we need vitamin C, we need magnesium, right? Magnesium is probably the number one deficiency, at least here in the United States. So making sure all of those nutrients are there um, can be very helpful in mood support. Beyond that, and definitely talk to doctors about this as well, but beyond that, giving certain amino acids um, giving certain amino acids uh, to help support certain pathways. So like amino acids to support serotonin versus dopamine versus epinephrine versus norepinephrine. That's the next level up um, and definitely should be done with the doctor. But those are a bunch of different things you can do. Lifestyle wise, exercise, diet, nutrition, good fats, digestion, bacterial flora. Those are all things, Holly, that um, should be absolutely considered when it comes to mood support. Terrell, M-T-H-F-R. I call it something dirty to remember it. <laughs> we'll say the mother effer mutation. <laughs> um, if you go to drpingle.com, Terrell, and you type in M as in Mary, T as in Tom, H as in happy, F as in Frank, R as in radio, and you hit search, you will find an article on that. MTHFR mutation. Does that help? Got it? Nice to meet you too. 
Uh, let's see. Avoiding tomatoes and bananas. Yeah, dairy. Susan, it's tough. It's kind of like coming to different, trying to pinpoint what it is. And there's nobody that's the same. Nobody has the same allergy. It's like they're all, you know, overlapping. Yeah, that's how I remembered um, that mutation in med school. I never forgot it because it's kind of like, oh, man, I got that one, you know. But it's a workaround because if you take methylated folate, you can actually get around that. Now, the other problems with MTH MTHFR mutation besides anxiety and depression are infertility, blood pressure issues. A lot of cardiovascular issues come from MTHFR. I'm convinced that's probably what did my dad in. Uh, he had a stroke at 58 years old, I did take his life. He was a smoker, okay, which when you combine that with the MTHFR mutation really causes a lot of problems. Toxins don't do well in people with that mutation. In fact, those out there that know all about breast implant illness, um, for those of you who have had implants and have ended up with breast implant illness, a lot of those now, they're linking to MTHFR mutation. And a lot of the plastic surgeons here in uh, Arizona um, have been working with naturopaths. I've had a couple conversations with them on um, screening people for that mutation before allowing them to get implants. Not saying that you can't still get breast implant illness from implants. Um, I really don't recommend them in general. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I, I just don't because I've just seen more problems. But then again, I'm in a naturopathic world where I'm going to see the majority of the problems. There's many people who don't have problems, but I see the majority of them, right? And they're finding the ones that I'm finding that have the reactions to them tend to have that mutation. So what they're trying to implement, and I think they've done it pretty well here in Arizona, although it's a, it's a constant movement, is the testing of that mutation prior to any implantation of anything because the body will react to it. It can't clear uh, the toxins. They're not exactly sure why, um, but for some reason, their body does not um, handle implanted things as well. It rejects it more. It's a pretty interesting area, and um, I met with the breast implant plant illness group, and um, I know they're working with a lot of plastic surgeons to implement that, but I think that's something that's overlooked. MTHFR can cause a lot of problems, so you should know if you have it, or at the very least, be taking methylated folate so that if you do have it, you can kind of override that a little bit, okay? Total Health Apothecary, thank you for writing that out. I appreciate that, Dr. Thiner. Is it Thiner? Thiner, okay. Can H. pylori affect the mood and overall health even after treatment? Yeah, because first of all, treatment is what? Antibiotics are part of that routine, right? along with the, you know, the PPI blocker, which is blocking acid, which also affects your gut flora. And then you've got the, you know, the anti-inflammatory, the Pepto-Bismol type thing, right? Um, so when you look at that killing off the gut flora, um, keep in mind that uh, acid in our stomach actually helps maintain healthy gut flora. So if you're blocking that with treatment and you're giving antibiotic, you're killing off all those probiotics, right? So if you don't have a healthy gut flora, you can't have a healthy mood, gut brain access. So yes, absolutely on H. pylori and mood, absolutely. Any gut disorder, any gut problems can cause changes in your moods, okay, for a multitude of reasons. Okay, I have to go soon, so we're gonna kinda uh, move through these last few questions. I do have a, a couple appointments today. Um, Will you find that in a complete blood test? Um, under a naturopath's care, usually there's some sort of screening. We find different ways to screen it and different ways to look at it. And a lot of us have really strong gut instinct on whether it's there uh, just from looking, from dealing with it so often. But you can, you can get screened for it through the main labs, Quest and LabCorp. You can do a saliva test. Uh, 23andMe is how I did it. That's how I found it, um, which is an at-home genetic test. Genetic testing is primarily how you do it, Terrell. And it's available through a bunch of different options. Speak to your doctor about that. I know who your doctor is. She'll be well-versed. No problems. Um, is taking too many supplements harsh on the liver? It can be. Yeah. It, just because they're natural doesn't mean they're always healthy. I, I mean, I'm going to say that. I'm saying that as a naturopath. It doesn't mean you should be taking 40 supplements for all sorts of different reasons. I mean, you have to use the right ones in the right time in the right order. You can't just throw everything in and expect to be well. That doesn't work that way. Um, how to restore that on the H. pylori. You know what? Check out drpingle.com. I'll try to do some more information on H. pylori, but there is a article. Um, I 
can't paste it on Instagram, which is really kind of frustrating. Um, on gut health, I have quite a few. If you type in gut, G-U-T, there's an, there's an article on anti-inflammatories of the gut. Um, I'm trying to find the name of it for you. There's some on bitters. Um, to scroll through the site on gut health. Um, anti-inflammatories for the gut, digestive enzymes. These are kind of the highlights. Digestive enzymes, anti-inflammatories for the gut, like glutamine, marshmallow, aloe, and a really good probiotic. Those are kind of your main three. And patience. <laughs> H. pylori can kind of be a bugger to go through, but you'll get through it. Uh, there are some natural microbials as well that you can use for H. pylori to kind of keep it at bay, like oregano, berberine, garlic. Garlic does pretty well, cinnamon. So looking at some of those as well. Uh, as well. Um, go through the website, check it out. Check the gut health videos. If you're new here, you can go to my YouTube channel or on Instagram feeds. I have a, quite a lot on that type of thing, not specific to H. pylori, but definitely on healing the gut, okay? Um, what happens when you take antibiotics every few months? You kill off your gut flora and then you have to replenish it. I would ask, why are you taking antibiotics every few months and is there another way to go about it um, to minimize the antibiotic need? Because you do develop resistance to them so it does become, it kind of shoots yourself in the foot. So obviously I use antibiotics when I need to but I really try to see if I can figure out why I'm needing them or why my patient's needing them and then see if I can circumvent that with better um, habits, um, gut healing, respiratory healing, whatever it may be. Um, all right, um, I'm on HRT, nothing has worked for non-existent libido. Yeah, you know, I think there's a myth that if your hormones are in perfect balance, you'll have a great libido. That's a myth, I'm sorry. If you're in the woods and you're running from a bear, I don't care if you're full of testosterone, you're not gonna stop and have sex right? Um, especially in women, there's a combination of a balanced... I know women who are post-menopause that are not taking hormones that have incredible sex lives. I know women that have tons of hormones, high testosterone, and they're not interested at all. That's not the only part. There's a mind-body connection there. There is definitely more to it than simply hormones, okay? So take a look at what else might be impacting your ability to have that libido. There's also a lot of issues that can happen down there that just you lose different abilities to, to have that reaction. Um, and I think often we beat ourselves up about that type of thing and maybe we need to stop beating ourselves up and just try to live in the moment and do the best we can. So there's a lot of different factors involved in that, just so you know. Are tomatoes not good for you if you have arthritis? Um, it depends. If you're allergic to nightshades, I wouldn't do tomatoes if you aren't. Uh, tomatoes have a lot of benefits too. Please make more videos on how the physical affects the mental. I'll do my best. Thank you. I try to incorporate that in everything. Uh, your vitamins have done wonders for me. Thank you, Kelly. I would love um, for you to share your experience. Share it with people. Let them know what you like about it, okay? Um, looking for, thank you for responding, blood pressure. I'll go through some of these comments. There's a lot on Facebook today. I'm going to need more Q&A days. Um, but I will definitely go through and try to answer, okay? Um, how can people feel so great at 45 when you don't take hardly any pills? Um, you know, I, everyone's a bit different. There's genetic predispositions. I mean, I feel pretty great. I, you know, I'm 44 years old. I feel great. Um, now, I would say I probably feel better now than I did 10 years ago. Um, and I think a lot of it has to just do with I figured out what my body needs and that's what I give it, you know? Um, and I think I have patients who are in their 80s or 90s and they are smart as a whip, they feel great, and I have patients in their 20s who don't. I mean, I think there's so many factors and I think to just link um, this one idea of what we're supposed to feel like or this one treatment of what we're supposed to feel like, I mean, I think everybody is so different and that's why individualized medicine is so critical. If everyone is treated exactly the same, we don't get the right results. Individualized medicine matters. The doctor taking the time to figure out what your body needs, how it needs it, how to go about it, and you figuring out how to be in tune with your body on what your body needs, I believe is the key to health. I do think also stress response, how you interpret stress makes a huge difference in how you feel, right? So hopefully that helps spread, but everyone is so different, you know? So, um, so many different food lists. Um, okay, I'll take a look at that. Are pills really necessary for living a good and healthy life? Um, no, uh, no. I mean, everyone is different, right? 
I mean, you take 500 milligrams of magnesium. I take about that too, magnesium glycinate every day. I feel better when I do. When I don't, I don't feel better. I, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, supplements that I used to take that I don't have to take anymore, uh, you know, because I've improved my diet or I've improved my stress response or what. So I think everybody is completely different. And I agree with you, mental fitness care, individualized medicine is the future of our health. We cannot all be put in the same box, okay? Doctor-patient relationship matters. Having flexibility and knowing who you're gonna work with and who you wanna work with and who gets you and who isn't is very, very, very important. Um, it's very important. Individual choice and individualized care matters. Um, all right. All right. I will go through and answer more of those questions. Welcome to those that are new. Um, I do have an email list at drpingle.com. If you have not signed up, you're missing out because I do send special offers through there, additional content, things to read up on. Um, so instead of following the crazy media, read about your health, you know? Uh, so if you wanna have that in your email box, sign up at drpingle.com. For those of you that were asking about the supplement line, thank you so much. Thank you for your feedback, totalhealthapothecary.com. If you guys have any further questions, I will do another q and I'll try to do them more often. Have some great topics coming up next week. Um, the, uh, what is my YouTube channel name? Dr. Trisha Pingle. And I believe that's linked from my main site as well. I think I have links to everything at drpingle.com. My program, um, I have a 30-day, um, well, really lifestyle, but 30-day adrenal fatigue program. I have supplement line, and then I have YouTube channel, which I try to keep up to date, but I am a little behind, so the last couple weeks of feed isn't up there yet, so you can always check Instagram at IGTV, you know, in my feed. Facebook, um, if you follow me on Facebook as well, all of my video feed is there as well, and then I try to get everyone up to YouTube the best that I can. Uh, I need to hire someone to do that for me, I guess. I just need to keep it going, um, but I try to get it all across all platforms. I also try to embed the videos into the articles at drpingle.com so when you're reading the article you can go through and watch the video as well. So I try to do it from a multiple different ways to make it as easy as possible for you guys to get the information. So um, thank you um, so much. I feel great. I have so much energy. I feel balanced mentally and physically. Um, I am 51 years old. I have more energy now than I did a year ago. I don't feel sluggish. That's great. From the supplements, thank you. I really appreciate it. The adrenal line really helps, right? Yeah, I really like those supplements. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you to all of you. Have a great day. I've got to get to Pilates, and then I have some appointments to go to, so I'm out of here. But um, thank you so much for being here um, every single morning. I'll see you guys back on Monday at 9.15 with another topic. Uh, this one will be an actual topic, won't be a Q&A, but I'll come up with something good for you. So have a great day, great weekend. And uh, keep smiling. Pass around the good energy to people. Don't fall into the negative trap. There's a lot out there today. Uh, so don't fall into it. Stay out of it. I wish everyone well. I hope everyone stays healthy. Uh, be positive. Move forward and spread that light to everyone else. I'll see you on Monday. Bye-bye now.